Hi everyone, my name is Dori Drachman. I am the co-coordinator with Dr. Gary Smith of the Peterborough Renewable Energy Project, or PREP. And this is the first in our monthly series of workshops. <laughs> our monthly series of workshops, we're also recording this, um, to, to let folks know about how how you can make your home or your car be more, be cleaner, and to bring in experts about various topics. And so we're really happy to see you today. Your, the attendance here was like beyond our conception, because I know we've got a full room. I don't know, how many people do we have online? 15. 15, so thank you all for coming. Um, PREP is the organization that brought you the board article a few years ago to commit the town to converting to 100% renewable energy and wrote the energy, the renewable energy plan that got passed by the select board in December 2022. So now we are uh, in the process of starting to implement this plan and part of that, a big part of that, is education. And so thank you for helping us implement this plan because we need you to do that. Um, <clears throat> let's see. What else did I forget about online? Oh, the Q&A. Q&A, thank you. Um, the Q&A is going to happen at the end because there's just so many people. So if you are online uh, listening and watching, please use the raise hand feature. Uh, uh, Bob will be able to hear you or and see you. see you or whatever, and you will be in the queue. Um, so without much further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today, who is Doug Nate, who is kind of a, a local a heat pump guru. Uh, he, yeah, he likes that. Um, he even looks like a guru. That's right. <laughs> uh, he is you know, the person that I always tell people to go to when they have a, a kind of out of the box kind of house situation with their heating system. He understands them backwards and forwards. He's been helping uh, customers and installers uh, with heat pumps for a few decades. 43 years. 43 years, to be precise. <laughs> Two score and three years ago. So he is the guy to be talking to. And it is my pleasure to introduce you, and I'm going to give it give the floor to Doug. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I gave this presentation in September. Um, not much has changed. Well, not much has changed in what I'm going to present today. But we need to know that this industry, and Dory and I were just talking about it, is changing every day. Um, all the incentives that are out there, both for homeowners and businesses and but also for the contractors to sell the product are changing as the manufacturers bring it into the country. Can Most I of the interject one thing? You've got a flyer about that. Just oh, okay, <laughs> good. Um, most of the manufacturers are uh, overseas, uh, mostly on the uh, Asian continent. And they don't always introduce all the new things to us until it's uh, been proven or otherwise uh, made enough money elsewhere before they bring it over to the country. But that's the way it is. Converting heat pumps. Let's go to the next screen. And somebody asked me, is it, is it okay for, we're going to talk about new construction, old construction, but primarily everybody here has probably already got a home. Uh, you're maybe building a new home at some point. I've got people who are consulting me with me about that. But um, anyway, it's, it's, this is across the board. New homes, old homes, it all works. What's a heat pump? All right. Uh, my go-to idea about a heat pump is uh, everybody's got a heat pump in this room, I'm sure, because we all have the refrigerator. And if you were to put your hand behind a refrigerator when the compressor is running, you would feel that it's warm. And that's what happens with a heat pump, is that we extract energy. I use the word energy, not heat. Extract <laughs> energy from a source. And the source could be air outside, 
or it could be a uh, fluid that's being pumped through the ground, like in geothermal. Uh, there's a whole lot of ways that we can get energy from sources of energy. Uh, the, the thing that makes it into a heat pump and air conditioner is this three-way valve here that changes what the two coils associated with the system. There's a condenser coil and an evaporator coil, and they switch. When you're in the heating mode, the evaporator coil is on the outside of the building, and when you're in the cooling mode, the evaporator coil is on the inside of the building. You don't, don't let this blow your mind. It's really available for you online afterwards, but that's how a heat pump works. It basically takes energy from a source and then delivers it to the space. Now, the question that was asked by someone who was not here is how do we do that with minus 13 degree air outside? And that's a thing called phase change and pressure. Um, the way I can describe pressure as um, affecting when you can change energy is that when you're at the top of Mount Everest, it doesn't take as much temperature to boil water as it does at sea level. That's the pressure differential. Phase change is when you change from uh, solid to liquid, liquid to gas. And each one of those lines, I'm not sure if I have a, I don't think I put that in here. If you were to look at the BTUs that are put into water boiling on your stove, I think you can all remember, I do, when I make coffee in the morning, you get to a point and that temperature is up at about 212. And then it keeps going across and absorbing BTUs until eventually it becomes steam. And that's where your whistle goes off and you say it's time for coffee. The, uh, so that's phase change. And refrigerants are everything, almost everything is a refrigerant. Water's a refrigerant, propane's a refrigerant. Um, R410A, which is the most common uh, refrigerant that we are using nowadays. And they, they change phase from liquid to gas, which is all we're worried about at this point, at different temperatures at different pressures. And so that allows us to use minus 13 degree air at a certain pressure to convert into gas or liquid, depending which way we're going. Are you saying that the heat pump works when it's minus 13 outside? Yes. That's that's the cold, there's a cold uh, temperature of heat pumps. It's always been available, but it's uh, the advent of variable speed compressors has made that available for us. So you have to order this particular kind that goes? Yes, yes. Uh, they're, uh, uh, they're, when I get into the efficiencies of, of, of the heat pumps, uh, I'll, I'll let you know what the how that temperature affects things. But yes, at minus 13, I can get, I'm gonna use an example. Um, Ann and Rick just recently put in a three ton? Three and a half, three and a half ton. Three and a half ton um, heat pump, it's, that's 42,000 BTUs of energy. That one will deliver those 42,000 BTUs of energy at five degrees outside full. From five degrees down to that minus 13, it starts to decline in the, in the capacity that you can get out of it. At minus 13, it's about 65%-ish of the energy that you got at five degrees or higher. So when you size the equipment, you need to size it for the minus 13. So if your heat load on your building is uh, minus at, at minus 13, which we saw last year, not yet this year, um, if it is 48,000 BTUs, you need to divide that by 0.65 to find out that you need a 60,000 BTU heat pump to do it at minus 30. <clears throat> Did I just blow it all your minds? You know, it's pretty well. uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So is it true then that at minus 13, there's still heat in the air? There's energy. There's energy in the air that you can... Correct use to you can move it and you and can, you can transfer it in through the refrigerant and the phase change of the refrigerant with a compressor and then deliver heat into the space okay. in that manner. 
So even even though it's really cold for us, there's still energy in that air that can be used. So we're well, still getting we're still getting something. Yeah, still get, oh yeah, yes, absolutely. We yes. just can't get the house to seventy. Well, are you have a heat pump now? Yeah. Oh, okay. So if you are not getting it to seventy, then it was undersized. At at whatever temperature, you aren't getting it to seventy. How old is it? How old is your system? Mm -hmm. I put it in last summer. Oh, it's new. Yeah. It's new. Underside. It, it's not a full house one, but it is something that heats. It, it can heat. I don't use it as heat, but I'm just, I'm here to learn what it can do for me. Well, I, I have to, in order to know what that can do, I have to know what that size is and have, what's your heat loss on, on that room or rooms that you have. Um, but that's, you can heat, they don't even shut off until minus 18. And that has to do with the temperature at which the refrigerant can't tra transfer energy at different pressures. It just can't do it. What is the refrigerant use? Good question. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through in an hour. We're starting to get into the yeah. We're starting to get into the yeah, uh, let's. Yeah. So let's let's, let's uh, try to hold off on the Q and A until after that. Okay. Uh, better than other better than other energy sources. Okay. So that's a subjective uh, question. Assuming that we're all here because we want um, to not emit as much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, our sources of electricity uh, are, depending on the state you're in. Um, either from fossil fuels, um, nuclear, some solar, some wind. Those are the sources of energy that we've got. As of now, uh, the, the amount of carbon dioxide that's put out into the air with a cold climate heat pump, and that goes, that's a cold climate, the minus 13 heat pump, it's probably sized, is putting out less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than these other energy sources. No, all right. Hold your question. If you if you got a question about what I just said, let's go to the next one. What are some heat pump options? Okay, this is good. Uh, I mentioned sources of energy. This is there are heat pumps. They're called air source heat pumps. They should be referred to as the, the initials A S H P. Air source heat pump. Uh, they get their source of energy from the air. Most people think of these things, oh, you mean a mini split? Yeah, a mini split that in most people's mind is um, something that hangs on the wall, which is what Rick and Ann have now with something outside and it blows heating or cooling air into the space. Um, and that's, that's your standard mini split. There are other uh, varieties of mini splits. Some of them look similar to whatever the heck that thing is um, that's in the ceiling and they blow air into the space. Those are mostly in commercial commercials uh, situations similar where they have a drop ceiling. You can have things that are high on the sidewall that are more horizontal. You can have console units. Um, you can have ducted, but those aren't good. Right now we're talking about mini splits that don't have a whole lot of fan power associated with them. And you know, I'll get into that a little bit later. All right, this is an important concept of efficiencies. So one of the one of the calculations you're going to see later on is you assuming a 250% um, efficiency rating. What that means is that for every unit of electricity that I put in, I'm getting 2.5 equivalent energy units out in the delivery to the space. However, with a heat air source heat pump, because the source temperature goes from minus 13 up to wherever you want heat, 47 degrees or higher, they vary what the efficiency is at all those different temperatures. It takes they're much less efficient down at minus 13 than they are at 47 degrees. Seasonal efficiency is based upon where you live. 
if in New Hampshire, the Department of Energy, uh, New Hampshire Department of Energy says that over the period of our heating season, the average efficiency is going to be 2.5. And that's because it's a variable amount of temperature outside every, you know, every day. Let's go to the next. I think the next one is just a picture. So this is the picture of your standard uh, heat pump. Um, I, I don't get any kickbacks from Mitsubishi, but uh, that this is a Mitsubishi. There are lots and lots of brands. Okay. So AHRI, it was um, air conditioning, heating, refrigeration um, institute. It's a uh, it's an organization that takes people's heat pumps and it runs them through the different temperatures outside. And it says, yep, at this temperature, you're gonna have 17 degrees and 47 degrees in the two places where they talk about that. Uh, they measure it. And at those two temperatures, they have different coefficients of, of, of performance. So you can see at 47 degrees, I'm getting a whole lot of energy out of that air, air delivered into the space at efficient rates. At 17, it's less, and then at minus 13, it's that. So that when you calculate what your seasonal usage of electricity is going to be, you need to know what these ratings are for your particular piece of equipment. And when you go to get different rebates, et cetera, they're going to have a certain minimum efficiency rating that you are required to have in order for you to get any kind of rebate. I, when I installed when I installed my geothermal heat pump system and I taxis and rolled around, I'd like to send them a picture of a certificate or I had to give it, have it in the file of the energy star rating that I had for my heat pump. All right, next page. All right, ducted. These are also heat pumps. They're not mini splits. They are split. The split being that there's a refrigeration piping coming from the outside to the inside unit. The difference here is this is a ducted unit. It has ductwork that comes off and goes to the diffusers in the space. Um, it is not as efficient because there's energy associated with moving that air through the ductwork. There's friction losses. And so it's not as an efficient unit the mini split with that wall unit is the most efficient air source heat pump that you can get. So you can see, I have a chart later on in the presentation that compares all of them, so you don't have to memorize this. <laughs> um, next page, please. Ground source. All right, so this is your geothermal. My friend Margaret Dillon um, says, it's not geothermal because it's not taking the energy directly from the uh, molten core of the earth. Now, I, I disagree with her, but I'm okay to call it ground <laughs> um, And basically all of our energy from the ground is uh, the nuclear plant that's down in the core of the, of the earth that's continuously uh, degrading and giving off energy, radiating towards Earth's surface. Anyway, enough of that rant. Ground source heat pump is uh, geothermal, where we have a number of ways of uh, getting energy from that nuclear power plant. Uh, the most, the current most common one that I get involved with our ground loop, where we drill a hole in the ground, we put a tube with a U at the bottom down into the ground, and pump fluid through that, we connect the outside of those tubing to the ground with what we call a grout. And it's a conductive, semi-solid conductive material that allows the energy to flow from the fluid inside the tubes out or in, depending on for air conditioning or heating mode. You can do that on a horizontal loop also, which I've done a few, um, which, are less expensive to install if you've got the right kind of um, and the right kind of uh, ground, and you're not going to run into rock at five feet. <laughs> and, 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 and you've done that a whole lot of doing. 
Um, but uh, it's less expensive than bringing the drill rig in at this point in time. Uh, so this, let's go to the next page where I talk about, okay. This, if you went to the fair last September, there was a man there named Bill Wenzel, who, you know, okay. Who, it, back to the picture that we had, that is the most efficient heat pump. I'm trying to make sure I don't lie about this for the whole season because it's a geothermal heat pump. So the outside air temperature is not a variable now. The ground temperature is pretty constant throughout the year. Uh, pretty constant. So these sources, the 32 degrees is a kind of a worst case scenario of the fluid temperature that we're coming through. But these efficiencies are for the whole year. It doesn't degrade at uh, minus 13 outside because we're getting the energy from the ground. That particular heat pump that I showed, the air handler is a packaged unit. That whole thing has the compressor, the two coils, the blower. That particular heat pump has um, the ability to vary the compressor operation and the blower operation. So you can install one of these into a house and have dampers in the ductwork and a thermostat on just this room, that room, that room. And the thermostat says, oh, I'd like a little heat in here. Open up this damper, turn on the heat pump, and the heat pump will only go to a certain rate of energy consumption for that room at that time, for both the blower and the compressor. Uh, so back, that, that, that's they're very, very, very efficient. Uh, if anybody, but they're also the most expensive thing. <laughs> so, as is true with most of life. Uh, let's go to the next one. All right, so this is a, a water to water. That's a picture of my heat pump. It's not really, but it's a picture of a catalog. That's what I have in Miami. And the long story why I got that, I built my own house back in, starting in 1980. Uh, had just a wood stove at the time. Um, over the years, much to my wife's consternation, I have done a whole bunch of different things. <laughs> the latest being installing one of these. Um, and it takes energy again from the ground and trans transforms it into water inside the building so that now it's like a forced hot water system versus a forced hot air system. Let's go to the next. It is not as efficient as the air, the water to air system, the geothermal to air system. And that's because I got one more transfer of energy from, instead of going to refrigerant directly to air, I got refrigerant that goes to water, then the water goes to air. So that, that different change there makes it less efficient overall. But pretty pretty darn good, and it's a consensus. It's consistent over the whole year that we get that those energies. Uh, Thirty-two fifty. Okay. Um, next, please. All right. So something I learned between September and now. This is very popular over in Vermont. We've installed some. I can think of only one now uh, that's installed. This is uh, made by Space Pack, and it's made down in Massachusetts, I believe. I'm sure they use components there from Asia, but uh, the product itself is, is from uh, Massachusetts. The, uh, the thing that I had to erase off of this slide is at the beginning of this line here. Does not have AHRI uh, certification at this point. So these, Numbers that I have here, 2.27, 1.63, 1.33, are based on the manufacturer saying, this is what it will do. I don't really like that. Um, and it's not going to get you a, any credit, I assume, unless, unless the person is reviewing your uh, uh, credit is from the state or from the federal government is smart enough to look at that. Not smart enough to look at that. This is not a certified rating. It is the least efficient of our heat pumps. The reason it is popular is that we can, um, you can, 
instead of drilling your geothermal hole for X amount of money, you just put this outside and extract energy from the air. But it is the least efficient of, of the systems that we got. Next, please. So this is a comparison. Again, this will be available to you as a uh, cheat sheet for which is the most efficient uh, systems. Um, this I have here, but it's not true for there. That's not a HRI. No. Go to the next page. All right, fossil fuel heating. This is one of the problems with uh, converting a, an existing structure to heat pumps is that your propane or your fuel oil, I don't think anybody here has natural gas, uh, propane, fuel oil, or even your pellet boiler, if you have pellet boilers, which is the case for a new Venusa neighborhood um, and other places. Uh, the library. <laughs> yeah, the library. Okay. Uh, that those systems can get 180 degree water or much or higher air. We're talking about water, 180 degree water. Heat pumps can only get you 125 degree water. Well, it can get a little higher, but I size my systems, my delivery systems for 125 degree water. I had to, when I put my geothermal in, I had to take my old baseboard out and put in these very big European style baseboard because they have more surface area that delivers as much BTUs as I need for the space with lower temperature water. Same thing goes for uh, forced hot air systems, oil or, or propane. The leaving temperatures for them are in the 113 to 143 versus with an air source heat pump um, it's not or an air air heat pump is going to get you 98 degree ish temperature going into the space. Yeah. Where that becomes a problem with ductive systems, and actually we discussed that with Rick and Ann, um, is that they have an existing propane head. I mean, well, we still got it. Existing propane furnace, and the duct work is the, designed to deliver a certain amount of cubic feet of air per minute CFM, and I don't think that it would have been sufficient to just plug a heat pump system into that and deliver as much BTUs into the space as required. So it's a limiting factor for converting existing systems. Into the space. Okay, operator, this is this is a good one. We just uh, discovered some uh, new information yesterday, literally. Um, let's go to the next. Current, this is the slide I had in September. There is a website here that you can go to and see under energy information and under yeah. New Hampshire fuel prices, where it's the average fuel price, oil, propane, pellet, pellets, cordwood, and electricity. And the electricity number is a blend of Liberty and... Um, Granite, Granite uh, Eversource, Unitil, all, all the different providers for the state it takes their average price for once, I think they change it once a month. Um, and that's what it was in, in uh, September. So let's let's go to the next page. So before I get into, well, there they are. Thermal efficiency, I talked about uh, energy out and bear energy in, COP, same thing. Pump heating season performance factor, you don't have to really worry about that. That's based on a place in, in uh, the, the seasonal temperatures in Pennsylvania, <laughs> but it, it's a variable. Fuel oil, as of, in September, I had to add this. This is September fuel oil, which is this many BTUs uh, per gallon. Uh, Average efficiency, this is where people go down to their basement and they see the oil guys put a tag on there and it says 84% uh, efficient. That's chemical efficiency, it's not thermal efficiency. It's, they measure the CO2 and other products and combustion that come out of the blue and they say, oh, we've converted 84% of it in chemi chemistry. Um, 
thermal efficiency is closer to 80% for a good new boiler. What happens with oil boilers and furnaces is that as soon as it's cleaned and you start using it, it starts to deposit a little bit of soot onto the heat exchanger. And soot is a, is a bit of an insulator. So you don't get as much efficiency of the transfer between the price combustion going out this way and the air flowing on the other side, or air or water. Uh, propane is better um, in terms of not losing that efficiency over the years. And the, the website that I gave you before is going to assume an 80% efficient propane furnace. That nobody's installing 80%. If they are, they're nuts. Uh, the condensing propane furnaces will get you 95% efficiency. And that's because, back to the phase change thing, they run the uh, temperature of the product's combustion down to 130 degrees, where it, it actually makes water about. So any new boiler or furnace that's used with propane will have a condensate drain off of it because you want it to be condensing the product's combustion into a water. It's still got CO2 going out, but it's also got water that's being ejected. Um, these numbers, again, they on their website, they, they BTUs per million dollars per B, million BTUs uh, is how they like to measure. Oil at that point in time in September was 35 and 11. And this is the average, okay? The, all the oil dealers are in the state, this is the average price that they had uh, of 389 per gallon. Uh, propane at 326 per gallon was a little bit higher, $37 to buy a million BTUs, $37.50. Electricity at that point in time, the average for all those providers was 22 cents a kilowatt hour. And this is where you get into that COP, the seasonal efficiency, the 2.5. This is based on, they only look at air source heat pumps on that website. So it was way more efficient, even for an air source heat pump, which is not the most efficient heat pump, that $25.78 gets you a million BTUs. So that was in September. Um, earlier this week, or well, yeah, earlier this week, I went onto the website and the current website, I'm not sure exactly when they updated it. It may have been in January, but saying we're in February, the website says same 38,500 BTUs per gallon, but the cost now is $4.08 average over the state, 80%, 36.82 dollars uh, for your million BTUs. Propane is 45.81. And then, damn it, 32 cents a kilowatt hour average. And that's, I pointed this out to Dory and Bob, and they said, I said, hold it. Uh, at 37.50, it's worse than your oil. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> so after a little uh, digging around, uh, I asked, Dory and Bob to find out what community power is charging for their electricity. And so I don't have a, sh a sheet for it now, but I do, did do some calculations. Um, if the, we figured the community, community power instead of 32 cents was $21.05 per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Cents, cents per kilowatt hour. I'm sorry. Cents. Yeah. Cents. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. 0.21. <laughs> yeah. 21 uh, cents about. And uh, so I took that and I did my magic calculation. I come up instead of uh, 37.50, it's 24.67 per million BTU. So it's still a whole lot better than propane or fuel. Oil. And that also is electricity that has 10% more. Uh, renewable energy in it than the default mm -hmm. rate that Eversource has. So I live in the in the uh, more conservative town of New Ipswich, and uh, I will be going to after making this discovery about the cost of community power versus I'm not sure what what they're paying for electricity. Be going to them and saying I don't care if you don't think that climate change is a real thing. But you're really kind of dumb not to uh, be thinking about that money. 
This, this will be Doug's last public presentation. Yeah. <laughs> We're hoping there's no one here on the select board and in Switch. No, I didn't feel like we uh, actually we installed a uh, VRF system in their town hall. Uh, when, you know, it's a heat pump system. VRF is a commercial size heat pump, which we don't need to get into here. Um, operating costs. All right. So another part of what Prep is doing is is advocating for building energy upgrades. And so that's where our value is really important uh, of your systems. Also, air infiltration is really important. These are just numbers that I think are important in understanding when you size your system, it's gotta be based on knowing what these numbers are. I, I think I'm gonna digress a little bit on this. So the heat loss calculation is if you have a, that wall right there. It's got a certain amount of insulation behind the sheetrock. It's got a certain amount of insulation value to the windows. And we calculate what the heat loss is out of all these surfaces that are exposed to the outside through this formula to come out with what the BTUs are required. So the room that you had, wherever you got the heat pump, who knows whether anybody did the calculation. They said, ah, it should be about this. Okay, um, I'm going to leave that for the bin data for a moment. Uh, the the uh, the local contractors are increasingly using a uh, some sort of program that I'm going to learn about in a, in a little while, where they just basically measure the square footage of the room, and they assume a worst case scenario, I guess, uh, based on what they think how old the house is. And they say, this is what your heat loss is. And I don't really think that's a good idea. I, mean, I, I think that one should uh, measure it, take a good guess at what, the, when was this house built? Well, it was built in 1960. So it's probably got a three inch stud wall and R11 at best insulation in there. That's the sort of heat loss heat gain that we should be doing before we size anything. Um, so I will talk about the bin data now. A bin data is the amount of bins, they define a bin as the amount of hours in a year in Concord, New Hampshire for us, that the temperature is minus 15 to minus 10, minus 10 to minus five, minus five to zero on off the day. So over that period of a year, you've got all those hours and you've got an efficiency for an air source heat pump associated with those different temperature bins. So we use that when we do calculations for what we can assume your usage will be in a year, what, how many year, hours it's going to be in those temperature ranges and what your particular heat pump is going to be efficient at that point. And that comes up, I think I, yeah, I have an example of it. Yeah, okay. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, did a, uh, a help one of the local contractors, Penny Fleming uh, Adina, for a private conference space. And we figured out that the heat loss based on our values of the windows and the walls and the roof was going to be 55,120 BTUs per hour at minus 15. Estimate loss that I then ran the program based on those bin data because it was an air source heat pump system. And at that point in time, with the new, I, I actually changed this. Well, actually, I don't have the, I have the 32 in there, the crappy kilowatt hour. <laughs> uh, so this would be much better. We took the ratio of 0 0.2105 to 32 cents. This number would be way lower. Or no, yeah, lower. Yeah, two thirds. Um, so again, it would be way more efficient um, to go with the air source heat pump. I was able, with that program that I have, I was able to then look at the amount of electricity I consumed in a year and the um, actual um, BTUs delivered. And my, instead of 2.5, it was 2.17 was the COP for that calculator for that. But it has, it was a, um, 
septic system. So we, we didn't have the wall hound units, which are the most efficient air source heat pumps. Uh, next, please. Ah, <laughs> all right. The, the, the best marriage in the world is um, solar and uh, heat pumps <laughs> because you're making your own KWH. You're, and, and people say, well, can I, um, can I run my heat pump off of my solar? And I say, sometimes. Uh, because that would be at the time that I'm making X amount of KWH with my solar, I'm also running my heat pump. The grid, the electric grid is our battery at this point in time. Um, yes, I have a backup battery system. It's only for when I lose power at night and I don't want to get up and fire off the generator. But you, over the period of a year, what we... <coughs> What we found here, well, this I'm going to go through the uh, the costs first. That's me. I don't know if you know Al Jenks. That's Al Jenks. That's uh, Joe Trainer, and that's E. Briggs. Uh, and uh, they suckered me to be at the top, so they figured I was more expendable. I could. <laughs> uh, I was also the youngest. The uh, <laughs> higher you are, the farther you fall. I uh, yeah, exactly. So this is a friend of mine in uh, who took the picture. Uh, he lives in Temple, and he went to a local contractor to get a cost for installing 24 300 watt output panels. And the contractor came back soup to nuts, doing the whole thing. You don't have to do a darn thing except writing a check, twenty two thousand dollars. My friend sent the uh, that quote to me, and I said mm -hmm. I'd done a few of installations before. I said. Ask what it would be if we did all the installation and had the cost of the electrician. And he came back and he said $18,000. I said, that's still too much. So we eventually we got the cost down to, with all of our free labor, uh, down to $12,000. It's quite a bit of difference. After the federal tax credit, 30%, $8,400. Uh, next. He, after the first year, he made 9,446 kilowatt hours. At that point in time, and now currently, we're at about 22 cents. Ironically, the higher that our rate is, the better our payback rate. But even at 22 cents. power right now at 8.1 cents a kilowatt? I'm sorry? You mean any power is at 8.1 cents a kilowatt rate? That's the supply. Yeah, okay. The supply. Oh, okay, this is with the need, everything. Okay. Okay. everything. okay, that's why I was getting confused. Thank you. Well, 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 uh, I'll address, I just want, we're almost done, and then I'll, I'll, I will clarify what Dory just tried to clean up. Uh, I think you did a fine job. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so anyway, cost of 22 cents a kilowatt hour at $8,400. Uh, he saved the 2200 uh, at 22 cents a kilowatt hour. The payback period would be four, about four years. I prefer to look at it. I'm not sure if there, anybody here has uh, assets. I took, would have taken my $8,400 assets out of whatever stocks there are or bonds. And I got a return on my investment of 24, almost 25%. And that's going to go on for the life of that product. They're all warranted about it. Um, I don't know what's next. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dance. To answer your question, yeah. that's that's the conundrum that we first went through when uh, I told Bob and Dory that the average electric price here in New Hampshire is thirty-two cents, and they went, "It's not that. It's this," which was just the energy cost. Mm -hmm. So the energy cost is this much, but then you pay for the transmission cost, you pay for federal taxes. Buried, uh, stranded, all kinds stranded, of stranded, 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 uh, you know, all kinds of things that they charge you for if you look at your electric bill. When people ask me about this, send me your electric bill. I want to see what you're actually a using over the whole year, and b um, what it is the kilowatt per whole kilowatt hour. The whole thing. Um, it just was something else to say. And most of the 
solar contractors are going to ask to get your electric bill, and they're going to look at your current usage. They aren't going to ask you, do you have a heat pump? Do you want to charge a car, electric car? They aren't going to ask you that. You want, I would want to tell them, and I have advised people, say, let's estimate if you install a heat pump, if you're going to buy an electric car, how many miles are you going to drive a year? And you can add those all up to what my kilowatt hours per year would be. Let's install a heat pump system, I mean a solar system, that will cover that over the period of a year. We'll produce that amount over the period of a year. Okay. All right. He, he, he was first. So I'd like, I'd like to continue with the solar sure. energy issue because yep. we just uh, renovated our house. Yep. Big renovation. Put in two air source heat pumps plus a split, split pack. Um, a split pack? I mean a, a mini split. Okay. One of the wall units. So you've got three different... Uh, yes. And, and we put in solar panels. Yep. But we were with Community Power. We live in Peterborough. We yep. were with Community Power and you cannot gain the advantage of the solar in the sense of when you produce more energy than your house uses, it goes away. Really? In other words, yes. I, I so we had to go back to Eversource. Yep. Mm -hmm. So now we're stuck with higher electricity rates. So it brings it it questions the usage of the heat pumps if the oil that we have as our primary source is actually according to your numbers yep. more efficient or from a financial standpoint so I can less this. expensive than using the heat pumps during the winter. So the thirty-two cents that Doug talked about is the average of all of the utilities. Right now, Eversource is by far the cheapest, okay. where their supply is actually a little bit less than our than the community power supply. Okay. Um, because they have few. Instead of it being eight point one cent, ours is eight point four. Theirs is eight point like one eight, so closer to eight point two. And um, that's because we've got a little bit more renewables in it. It's still way cheaper than it was in the 12 cent range, the last rate, uh, rate session. Um, so you are getting a much better deal than the 32 cents. You're getting more like the 21 cents okay. as well. Um, and the other thing to know is that we are working, we meaning CPCNH, the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire, on getting the utilities to, to do what the law says, which is to allow us to do net metering. Okay. 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 That, that's, that's yeah, the really, net metering that's, is that's, the, yeah, that's the key. The net metering is the key thing. It, it, absolutely. And we've been, totally. we're, yeah. we are, we that are makes working. Because we don't have batteries. We didn't that's correct. Right. That, that goes back to, I didn't know that that was a problem yeah, yes. that you had. Um, I will tell you that we're working on it. My solar is ten years old now, um, and I only have been running the heat pump really full time. Not full. Time, yeah, it's full time. I still use wood heat, but um, full time for this past winter. Before I started really running the heat pump continuously, um, I they had owed me sixteen thousand kilowatt hours. <laughs> Every source does. It had no value for me to change to anything because they owed me so much kilowatt hours. And interestingly, every year they send me a, a snail mail saying, would you like a check for this? And I say, no. <laughs> because they're only going to give you the cost of the electricity back yeah, versus okay. the whole thing. And I say, no, I'll, I'll just keep using it until I slowly drop down. Uh, you were next. Yeah, quick question about... Um, you, you talked about the air to fluid yep. heat pump, and um, just I'm thinking about taking out the oil burner in my house yep. and putting in uh, an air to to water yep. heat pump yep. for radiant heat. Is yep. it worthwhile to use it? Uh, well, that's, that's a, it's a good. It's the best way to radiant heat is the best way to use heat pump water. Heat it Heated liquid, heated liquid. Yeah. So, so that's still, that's still efficient. Okay. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's, so it's most radiant systems. Depending how many Persian rugs you got on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it's an R value. It's an R value to that. So there's a, they, people. 
the charts that you use in your gradient um, sizing is says, well, well you got R value on top of this floor where you got all the tubes installed. And so that reduces the amount of BTUs I can deliver through it. It's the same thing that's going on where the air the temperature is going that way. Um, so you need so, to put the rugs underneath <coughs> the tubing? <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, anyway, so yes, it, it's an efficient way of using it of that temperature. Because it's, like I said, 125. Most most radiant systems that I design uh, are in that 125 or, or lower temperature that you can uh, deliver enough BTUs to the space. And the reason for that is that I got this big freaking radiator underneath me as opposed to the thing, little thing hanging on the wall. So that's why radiant works that way. It's a big surface area that's delivering BTUs to the space. Thank you. Sure. Uh, heat pump for a, a hot water heater. Yep. Uh, where would the heat pump go? Does that go in your cellar with the water heater? Good question. Um, I should pr probably put that as a part of this presentation. But uh, So we're talking domestic hot water. All right. Currently, there's, well, there's the best option for you right now, especially with an existing basement, cellar, a.k.a. cellar. Uh, is to put that heat pump in the basement. And that's regardless of whether you have a furnace down there or a boiler down there. I'm talking your existing basement. Your existing basement probably does not have insulation through the walls, much less through the floor. So this kind of messes with people's heads, but what you have in putting a domestic hot water heat pump in your basement is kind of a geothermal system. <laughs> because there, the temperature of that uninsulated floor and walls is delivering energy through the space as you draw it down with your, with your heat pump. So yes, that's the best way in existing basements to do that. This is a case of New technologies are coming around the bend. Uh, Mitsubishi has a commercial grade air source domestic water heat pump. Commercial grade means that it needs three phase electrical power. I think they've probably got three phase power here yes, in the yes. library. Um, most houses don't have it. Um, that technology may be applicable to, is anybody here from New Venusa neighborhood? Okay, all right. I've been speaking with Gene Foster about the future. Uh, if you can get three-phase power there instead of using your pallet plant uh, to deliver heating and domestic hot water, uh, energy to the space, and I knew you were. Uh, you could put one of these three-phase power and deliver just basically domestic hot water to the individual. It uses an outdoor condenser as opposed to the packaged condenser which, and, and compressor, which is in the package unit that you put in your basement. Does it take up a lot of room? No. It's a stand, it, is, it is about the same width as your standard water heater. It's a little higher. On top of that tank is a compressor and, and coil and a little blower that moves the air through, takes the energy out of the air, it has the advantage of dehumidifying the basement in the summertime. And it'll cool your boiler handling. Yeah, right. yeah, if you have a boiler seal. Yeah. Does that make the basement colder? Yes. 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 It, does. it absolutely does. So does it help with the freeze pipes? Or? No, not that far. Okay. So they're all set up that um, it measures the temperature of the air in the space that it's drawing through and is saying, hey, look, it's a little bit too cold here. We're just going to go to straight electric resistance heat for your um, for the domestic hot water. The percentage of time that is, that's again almost back to the bin data aspect, which is for your particular basement, your particular amount of surface area, all kinds of things that are going on. Actually, it even gets heat through an uninsulated floor back down into the space. Um, so you're right, it does get cold, and that's what makes you be able to dehumidify in the base, and, and it always has a drain pump that has to pump that condensate out of the basement. Whoa, I don't know who was first. Uh, 
I already talked to you, but I will talk to you soon. Well, that's a quick question. Um, can you use uh, the heat pumps to do an on-demand water system? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. So, <clears throat> that, that's my latest science experiment. <laughs> uh, currently, I, I have two big domestic water storage tanks. Don't ask me why. Uh, but I currently heat them with a really nice <coughs> Beastman propane boiler. Uh, I would like to stop that. So I have purchased a on-demand uh, electric water heater. I will preheat that domestic hot water with a plate <coughs> heat exchanger with my geothermal heat pump up to 95, 100, or whatever, to be determined. I can raise it to that temperature from the 55 or 50 <coughs> degree water that's coming out of my well up to that temperature. So that's a certain amount of BTUs. Now I'm going to take that 95 and I'm going to run it through a on-demand electric water heater and deliver whatever temperature I want to my showers and tub. Does that answer the question? Sort of, yeah. Sort of. Sort yeah. of, kind of. Well, it's new construction, so I don't have the, all of that. We just want to do the on-demand. Yeah. So you got, you got my website. You got my, yep, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that's my email. You get the website too with that. But uh, let, let me know. I'll, I'll help you. Okay. Uh, cool. Yes, sir. Um, this might be a little out of scope, but it's mini split. What do you think about using mini splits for cooling only in the summer and not using them for heat? Is that like um, like compared to using portable units around the house? And well, they they, they are more efficient. But I would say, if you're going to install a mini split, why wouldn't you do a heat pump? Because it lives at Newby. Yeah, we already have a community-wide heat system, unless we change that to a more efficient system. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I'm aware, because this is something I talked with with Jane, yeah, is, exactly. is that right now you're, <laughs> right now you're, you're paying on a per square foot basis for the amount of, which is nuts. Uh, I, I many years ago. Sorry, I, I, I'm a plain speaker. It's nuts because that square foot on the second floor is not using as much energy as that square foot on the first floor. Period. Uh, I ran into the same thing over. There's a uh, condo complex in the center of uh, Jaffrey. And they are doing something equally as nuts, trying to um, deliver uh, expenses to each individual owner. Um, I just want to give a word of caution. I've been through this fall. We, we bought a house last December. Yep. And it was built in the 50s. Okay. And uh, which is modern for my sake. <laughs> um, wow. But, um, you don't look that old. Well, in 1797 was my last house. Okay. Oh, I got it. Okay. Uh, but um, basically, I found that there was a whole bunch of charlatans out there. Yep. Oh, yeah. And with solar, there were a whole bunch of people willing to do it. Get to put in a solar system for me yep. until one guy showed up and he said, I did a shade study on your roof. Yep. And it would cost you way too much in, in solar panels for you to ever get your money out of it. To totally. And no, 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 no. I, I, have a, I have fairly good exposure, but there, was, there were trees in the wrong place and Yep. It probably would have cost me an additional um, 15000 to take down the trees. Yeah. Is it, Doug, can I speak to sure. this for a moment? Sure. Yeah. This actually leads to a program that PREP is doing. Um, we have a heat pump. Uh, we, we are partnering with a heat pump uh, technology firm called Block Power. And they are um, working with us to help us electrify the homes in Peterborough. And they primarily are encouraging air source heat pumps. And we've been working with them to um, help us do that 
on a small scale right now and they are working primarily with with two installers that have been vetted so that's that's the piece I wanted to speak to about um, so we're working with two different installers if you sign up through them and get your mini or get your system through through this process you can also take an extra two hundred dollars off uh, for the first 15 people in 2024 and we will be and no no comments from the peanut gallery here um, and uh, we will be doing a bigger heat pump uh, campaign starting sometime in the spring and since you are now on our mailing list you will get to hear about when that's going to happen and more details when it does happen uh, there will be more incentives um, and I also just want to say too that there is going to be another workshop in about a month to to learn about the various incentives discounts rebates and tax credits for installing heat pumps and lots of other things. So you will also, there's a card about that. So I just wanted to give a plug about us doing some vetting for you so you don't get a charlatan. Okay, well, I'm from Wilton, but yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh, the, other, uh, the other issue was with heat pumps. Most of the people wanted to install um, a Bosch heat pump that they that said it was good down to five degrees, but they said they would start turning it off at, about, at around 25 degrees and using your furnace as a backup. And then on top of that, what they said was um, that my plenum was too short because my my, my old furnace was too tall and it wouldn't take the heat exchanger from the heat pump uh, and that would mean a uh, reducting in everything else and, and uh, you know and they put in that that in the bid and what yep. have you yep. and then um, on top of that if I wanted to use the air conditioning portion since I'm a forced hot air system yep. you'd have to insulate the duct uh, you have to insulate all the ducts in the basement right which was rather expensive to do. Yep. Because they're all wedged in between the, you know, you have to take down all the ducting, wrap them, and put them back up. So my, my advice for you would be that don't try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now we put the project on hold. Okay. Uh, so this is where it gets into aesthetics. So um, my advice is that you consider multiple indoor units like Rick and Ann have done with one outdoor unit I would say that I'm going to assume you don't want to see something hanging on the wall because I run into that all the time but having a console style unit in the space does the same sort of thing it doesn't catch your eye when you walk into your room oh, oh I don't like that it's down on the wall um, and it delivers energy to the space. You, I'm not sure how your house is, but you can have multiple indoor units with one outdoor unit. Um, and forget the one, the, uh, the furnace thing. However, back to that bin data. So how many hours of the year is it at uh, five degrees and, and below? Not very many, and decreasingly so. For now. You can, for, now. <laughs> for now. For <laughs> now. So, um, you can install a system uh, that you can afford and you like the way it looks in the space and it will go down to five degrees. And then below five degrees, you don't have to do a darn thing. You just have your thermostat for your existing oil furnace set at two degrees below what your temperatures are on your heat pumps and they can't keep up, the oil comes on for that 25 hours a year that you've got, something like that. So, so this would be a console heat pump? Console, I, I didn't do a picture of them, but they have, all the manufacturers have, it's sit on the wall, um, they're, they're not as big as what you see in a hotel, 
but they're the same concept. Because those are heat pumps in the hotels. They're, they're air source heat pumps. They're not low temperature air source heat pumps, but they they are heat pumps. So it's it's sort of well, it's you know, it's not a thing of beauty. It's white. It's white, and you know, it's got a little louver on the top. Actually, they're pretty cool because they are um, when it goes in the heating mode, it delivers the air at the floor. So the heat rises up. In the cooling mode, it delivers the air out the top. So it reverses the order of the airflow in the, in the system. Um, sorry. We you got so to pick up on the shade yep. question. Yeah. We have uh, heat panels that we solar panels we installed six years ago. Yep. We cut a couple of trees to get, and we got much better efficiency. Yep. However, we didn't account for the snow. Snow sticks on those panels, and we've had weeks when we're not generating any electricity from our solar panels yep. because of the snow. And we wondered, it, why doesn't somebody invent a radiant heater system that will melt the snow? So what pitch roof do you have? Right. About uh, 45, yeah. 45? You like this? Yeah, <laughs> that's not 45. Oh. And, and, and the point, the point being, is that when I design a, a system, I, I, if it's a ground mount and I don't have a 12 pitch, 45 is a 12. This pitch. is a 12 pitch, yeah. Okay, approximately. All right, so there's a couple of things that could be going on with you. Um, I have a friend in Francistown who had some initial uh, panels installed, and uh, he had them up at the top, which is a good place because it uh, got the most sun. However, there was a big piece of, of um, roof still exposed at the bottom of that. So the snow would slide down, and then it would stick on that roof, and it would start to build up back over top of that. So the, now a year and a half, two years ago, uh, I helped them install some additional heat pumps that now extended that whole array down to below the eave of the roof. And he says, it goes I'll get to it when it's my turn. Okay, all right. Uh, anyway, well, that's a whole lot of illegal systems. Um, uh, so that that could be what's going on. I, yesterday, this last snow, it stuck on my 45-degree ground mount, uh, and uh, it, it's gone now. But it took a few days for it to melt and, and slide off. All right, you're next. All right, why am I illegal? Hold on. My name's Trudeau. I'm the building inspector down in Lineboro. I have been for six years. Um, I had a question, but I think I'll pass on that. It's about effects of high humidity. Maybe when I'm done, you could speak of sure. effects of high humidity on an air source system. But <clears throat> choices are really what everybody needs to be thinking about. Uh, the uh, um, carbon footprint that we all are involved with regarding electricity is based on uh, where does that electricity come from? How is that power being generated? If it's an old or coal plant, then it's the worst possible type. If it's a natural gas, uh, it's almost the best. Nuclear is the cleanest. So that being said, um, to speak to what I just said, the illegal part, yeah. there are, the New Hampshire Building Code does not uh, provide for having uh, solar modules, PV modules, down to the very edge of a roof. There has to be an area where a fireman can, can get to the edge of that roof and effectively help in, that, in an emergency, as well as the edges and the top. An array cannot go 100% to the, the, the bottom eave to the ridge or to the edge, they can go close, depending on the nature of the construction of the roof. This fact is involved. Yeah, I, I, um, I've, I've had this this conversation before, and it's we, we, we'll take that offline. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, all right. Um, so, to you think about? I, I, yeah, go ahead. I would, sorry, I, uh, sorry to interrupt. I just want to say to the people who are online, uh, okay. maybe you didn't see my chat. If you have questions. Uh, click on the raise hand option in the Zoom toolbar. It might be under the more button. And now we'll back to our local I, I, sponsor. I would say to, to everybody, 
whether you've already done or contemplating, mainly I guess to the thoroughs that are contemplating, whether to do PV uh, uh, heat pumps. And I've inspected in six years at least 50 installs of, uh, of uh, um, heat pump systems of various types, including geothermal. Yeah. Um, consult your building inspector in your town. Peter Burl's got a great one. Tim Burl, he's a smart guy. I know him. Uh, we're both members of the Building Officials Association where we learn a lot, where we get training every month. We learn a lot about all of this stuff. And uh, uh, consult the building inspector because he'll see to it that you do things to code, of course, and of course, but can also advise. We advise people on uh, uh, sizes of solar arrays, shade, you know, the things like that I've inspected. Lango's got one or two, it seems, uh, a solar array is going on a month. It's, 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 they're just popping up everywhere. Yep. Uh, more, more roof mounts than ground mounts, but now we've got a pretty big ground mount ahead of me to be looking at. Uh, and I think ground mounts are probably better because sooner or later you're going to have to do something to your roof. And if you've got all those modules up there, you are got to take them off to fix the roof. So yep. that ought to be a consideration. All the information that you can possibly get needs to be factored in to your final decision. So it's important stuff. Thank you for that. Sure. Okay. So Anne was... So do you get credits with Eversource in kilowatt hours. I, we yes. get credits in dollars. Yeah. I think you were grandfathered in. Is yeah. It, it, yeah. It's change. So between. we're getting screwed. It's not really net metering. Correct. With community power, if you can get net metering, will it be real net metering or will it be like other sources? Well, so there's two different ever source plans. There was the one that was grandfathered in and then they changed it to net metering two, um, I think in 2017. So I think that the best we would be able to do is the 2017 one. So it would not be what you're calling real net metering. It does not cover all of the expense, but it at least covers the supply. I know, I know it's, it's that, that we need to take up with the PUC. The, you know, I read the PUC document and it says they're not allowed to do that. They're it's well, against the law, according to the PUC documents. Right, and and in the community power law that got passed, it said that the utilities need to, or, or yes, they need to give us the data that allows for community power uh, programs to do net metering, and they are not following that, and the PUC is not uh, not forcing them to to do that. So we have a big problem with our PUC. Well, and the legislature who is passing the laws that the yes. PUC has to adhere to. Can you use those flexible high pressure air conditioning ducts? Yes. Uh, you can use those for the system so you don't have to run them through your forced hot air system? Yes, but again, it has to be sized for that lower temperature air that you're going to be delivering. So they're going to have to be bigger? No. It just made more. More, okay. <laughs> so instead of having three of those little holes in the floor or in the ceiling, you may have to have six or eight. So you have to run six tubes. Six of those tubes out. All of which. Yeah. It's, it's like a lot more tubing, a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but it's because you've got an existing system and you can't run regular duct work and you're trying to do this, this old house Unico thing. Yes. So if you can run it through the basement, it doesn't make much difference. It is. You still, for if I'm going to deliver the same amount of BTUs with a heat pump system um, to a space as I do with a propane furnace or a boiler furnace, let's talk a furnace, I have to have bigger ductwork, okay. basically, and, and more delivery spaces in the in the in the room. Oh, one more question. Uh, we have a forced air system yep. with uh, integrated humidifier. Yep. Is that possible with oh, uh, yeah. heat pump? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> Quick question about humidity. Yes. Yeah. The effect of high humidity, excess of high humidity on an air source system, if any. Yeah. Indoors. Uh, no, actually not. Okay. So most most systems <coughs> most. Uh, Air conditioning systems, period, except we get in computer rooms, um, take about, they, they are sized, the coil is sized with the temperature of refrigerant going through that coil, 
to do about 75% uh, sensible capacity and 25% latent capacity, which is dehumidifying. And, and, and that goes back, back to, I had a question very recently uh, about oversizing a system. It used to be when I first got into this business 43 years ago, you don't oversize the heat pump systems, it'll short cycle and you won't wring the humidity out of the air. But now that we got the variable speed units, you, you can oversize them to your heart's content, and it will still run and dehumidify during the summertime. Excellent. If I could say very quickly, one more thing about electric usage. There's been a movement going on nationwide to get people uh, on board with using more electricity for, for, for all their appliances and all their everything. Yet the infrastructure in this nation is not there not to yet. provide it. So, uh, going with uh, PV generation, solar panels, uh, makes great sense uh, mostly. If you carry it to the best result, my son has a brand new house. He's got only a five and a half kW a system. He's completely off grid. There isn't a utility bowl for 10 miles. Yeah. And he has a comfortable system. He's got radiant heat and concrete floors in his house, and he's very comfortable. Uh, Generating your own power and storing that power is, is the, the best possible way to go forward uh, in that you'll have power when you need it. Yeah. So. That's the plan. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. And on that right. note. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, yeah. I just, yeah. Yeah. well, actually, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, a reminder that we'll be having another workshop next month on the 16th about how you can save money installing one of these systems. Um, and other projects that you have because there are some really good incentives that are there in place now and that will be coming in place in the next six months or so. So um, hope to see you there. If you haven't had a chance to sign in, please do so we can let you know about events like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.